Good afternoon. Uh, welcome. My name is Daniel Schumann, and I'm the director of the Advisory Committee on Transparency, which is hosting today's event. Today's discussion is going to focus on whether Congress is serious about transparency. We're going to explore the progress that's been made over the 112th Congress and also identify some of the deficits. Uh, we're going to do my speaking portion very quickly because what's really interesting, of course, is what our panelists have to say. So let me just start by introducing them. Uh, immediately on my right is Hugh Halperin, the Staff Director for the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Rules. Uh, on the committee, he serves as Chairman David Dreyer's Chief Advisor on Committee and Leadership Matters. Immediately to my left is Jim Harper, the Director of Information Policy Studies at the Cato Institute, and he's also the founder of WashingtonWatch.com, which keeps a very close eye on legislation and federal spending. Jim has also asked me to mention WashingtonWatch.com at least several times <laughs> during the course of this presentation. And last but not least is John Wunderlich, who's the uh, policy director at the Sunlight Foundation in an all-around transparency gadfly. That is actually part of his official title. <laughs> There's more information about today's panelists on your chairs and also at transparencycaucus.org. I'd like to thank Representatives Isa and Quigley, who are the co-chairs of the Congressional Transparency Caucus for giving us the space and the opportunity to have the conversation with you here today. Uh, like I said, I promised I would be brief, and I am. I'm going to turn to our first panelist, to you, please. Thanks, uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, thanks to you and the Advisory Committee and the Sunlight Foundation for having me this afternoon. Um, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about where we've been over the last two years, and and maybe a little bit about where we're where we're headed uh, uh, in the relatively near future. You know, about this time, two years ago, uh, our political folks were starting to make noise that it was uh, that it was certainly possible, if not likely, that that Republicans were going to uh, 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 obtain the majority in the House again, and. Um, we were sort of very quietly trying to identify issues that, that would come up uh, during a transition. And as many of you know, uh, among Republicans, one of the big issues was sort of this read the bill issue. You know, having text available, making sure that members had the opportunity to see what it was that they were voting on. And I think in large part because of the, the issues surrounding that and the, the drive to make that, that material available, uh, the 112th Congress really sort of marked probably the biggest sea change in terms of transparency uh, since the, the mid-90s when Speaker Gingrich really pushed the library uh, to, to make Thomas and all of that information available to the public. Uh, and as we started this both during the transition uh, last time around and and going forward this through this Congress. Uh, I think the Speaker, uh, Leader Cantor, and frankly the Republican Conference as a whole has, has tried to lead on on transparency issues and has made them a, made them a priority. Uh, this got manifested in a number of uh, different ways during uh, our, our rules package. Most notably, uh, was uh, the rules change, which said for the first time in the history of the Republic, the paper and electronic versions of a document were equivalent. That if, if something was available electronically, it was as good as if it had been printed by the government printing office, stuck on a truck, delivered over here, and then distributed to individual offices. Um, there were other things we did, mandatory webcasting, trying to really push committees to do that to the maximum extent practicable. Um, we also, as part of the uh, effort to make electronic text available and uh, to you know, serve as a place where we could measure our own efforts to comply with the three-day rule, we created docs.house.gov, which is a centralized portal for text coming up on the floor uh, in the coming week. Um, so far, for all of this year, that has uh, been online for stuff coming to the floor uh, through a lot of good work from our, our colleagues over in the clerk's office. 
uh, I would expect that that would come online for committees early next year. Um, but that works that works ongoing. Um, you know, I think looking at the next Congress, uh, we've we've I don't see the need for a whole lot of rules changes on this front. Uh, obviously, we're we're willing to entertain suggestions, but I think we're still in the process of, of frankly implementing the rules changes we made last time around and sort of evaluating their impact on on what we're doing here in terms of our day-to-day -day legislative business. Um, you know, and I think individual committees are trying to work really hard to, uh, to make themselves more transparent. I know we are at the Rules Committee. Um, I know the last one of these panel discussions I did, uh, uh, I was trying to hype a new website, and because of uh, the issues that generally arise with these things, it's a little bit late, but hopefully this month we will be launching a new uh, rules.house.gov um, centered on search, trying to make it easier for everybody to find what it is that they're looking to research. Um, we're, we're putting more data online in structured data formats. Uh, I was talking about a little bit earlier our, uh, our rules committee uh, resolutions, the rules that provide for consideration of legislation on the floor. Uh, right now, we are producing good XML uh, on a daily basis posting that stuff online, making it available, uh, and we hope to s soon be in a position to do the same kind of thing with committee reports, which actually contains the, the text of amendments. Um, and I'm sure is going to come up. Uh, there's a lot of interest in sort of bulk data downloads, trying to get uh, information uh, out, of, out of our data systems that you all in the, in the public can manipulate, and frankly, folks up here on the Hill can as well. Uh, that is an issue that may not be quite as simple as it, as it appears on first blush, but I think uh, the, the leadership here in the House and our, our colleagues in the clerk's office and other legislative branch agencies are all uh, focused on trying to, trying to make that happen to the to the maximum extent we can. Um, you know, I think just to wrap up, uh, there are always things that we can do better. We're always open to open to suggestions and and uh, uh, you know constructive kind of criticism. But I think if you look back at our record over the 112th Congress, uh, in terms of openness and transparency, it's something we can uh, we can be very proud of. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I should start typing rules.house.gov as well as WashingtonWatch.com. Uh, and speaking of uh, Jim. Thank you, Daniel, for mentioning WashingtonWatch.com. He's referring to a, an event some years ago where I repeated the name of my website many times over, uh, WashingtonWatch.com, in case you were curious. Um, because I see some of the you know, biggest tech bloggers are constantly, constantly scraping and striving for, for mentions of their sites. And so saying WashingtonWatch.com wouldn't seem to hurt very much. Um, uh, I appreciate uh, uh, Daniel's work and the work of the Sunlight Foundation uh, and, and Hugh's perspective on things. It's, it's important to, to give things some perspective. And I, mean, I was interested by the, by the mention of the Read the Bill movement or the Read the Bill the push, because I think that's um, uh, that phrase, Read the Bill, um, doesn't really mean that people literally want, though, though they may think they literally want their members of the Congress to sit down and read bills. It's a broader demand for fuller understanding, certainly in Congress, but also across the land about what's going on here. So it's a nice touchstone, read the bill, um, but it's part, I think, of a broader a broader push that all these efforts are, are a part of. Um, I think uh, when I look at the history of this this issue, uh, it goes back to the, the election of President Obama and the, the real uh, energy he brought on the campaign trail in 2008 to the question of transparency and, and the kind of good government that I think we all envision. And from my perspective, by about 2010, that energy had kind of dissipated. A lot of a lot of efforts had gone toward a lot of things, and we weren't seeing that sort of dramatic transfer to transformation that a lot of us can visualize. We can imagine knowing what the power of data is, but it wasn't wasn't happening very much, and and that caused me to 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 do some work that I'll describe here, uh, that that results in some grades that I'll talk about. 
grading is a cruel art, but uh, it's sometimes a necessary art and helps communicate things. Um, what I what I did was I looked at, at at the problem of sort of flagging transparency efforts around 2010. I it, it looked to me like maybe the transparency community hadn't communicated well enough to, to the government side what it was we wanted. Because a lot of efforts had, had gone out there that didn't really have a direction, didn't really have a destination. And and so I sat down with some some um, technical people. I'm a lawyer, and so I have to, had to go back and learn about how these computers work, the talking to each other on the internet and things like that. And uh, but sat down with some data people to try to interpret in a, in in language that maybe policymakers could understand what it was that data people need. And in a, in a paper that most of you have uh, on your chairs, publication practices for transparent government, I summarized those, and they basically summarized to four practices that that um, put put the public in a position to make their government transparent. It's not automatic, but uh, but these data practices can enable the community to use the information that, that uh, the government may publish. And the practices very briefly are authoritative sourcing. That is simply putting the data where everybody knows to find it. Uh, availability, that means uptime, permanence, completeness, uh, bulk and incremental availability. Machine discoverability, that is it's, it's um, located on the internet in a way that machines can come find it. The, the quintessential example would be search engine spiders could come and find the stuff that you put up. And then the, the, the real key is machine readability, and that is structuring of the data so that the semantic information is available, at least basic semantic understanding of what, what the heck is there. Um, that makes it so that, that the internet, quote unquote, can use data. And you see that you, you see that the good information is available about things because because the data underlying them is well structured. Um, coders can then go write something that goes and finds what they need and, and dozens or hundreds of different, I, I envision dozens or, 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 or getting up to you know, 100 more or more um, different kinds of websites or information services or what have you all built on well-published government data. Having a, a theoretical model for um, publication of data is, is, is nice and all but the question is really where the rubber hits the road, and that's that's what the grading is for. It's to communicate to non-technical audiences uh, how we're doing. Uh, and I've I've now I've certainly worked on this, but I've benefited greatly from a, a number of groups. The Sunlight Foundation being one, National Priorities Project, OMB Watch, GovTrack.us, run by Josh Tauber. They've all participated in helping me figure out how we're doing as far as publication. Of course, the grades are are the grades I'm giving, and and and. So anything you don't like about them are my fault, not the fault of the organizations that uh, that have helped me. And th the grades are um, not good, but the good news for Congress, I suppose, is that the administration's grades are even worse. Uh, I'll go through just some highlights and lowlights, emphasizing the, the Congress side because that's what we're talking about. And there are highlights, and uh, along with some lowlights, probably the one there's a he there's a hero somewhere uh, in the person who created a thing called BioGuide which is a deep historical record of all um, uh, federal representatives, including, and this is the key thing, a distinct identifier for all of them. And BioGuide makes its way out there. You see the use of this identifier on congressional websites and all over the place. Um, the, one, the one flaw around BioGuide is the fact that, that we get it intermediated through websites rather than just as a direct publication of the data. So when we, when we look for House and Senate membership, we can figure it out, and the, the, the websites that intermediate the information are, uh, are we can reverse engineer the data about who the members of Congress are, but, but just a plain old list would be great. The Senate actually does have an XML member list. Um, the, the Senate, um, oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at my own notes on, on, uh, on differences, highlights and lowlights. Um, the House, as far as meetings of House, Senate, and committees, um, there, the two the two sides are have interesting um, quirks. Each of them, docs.house.gov is real forward progress, and I think it's important. And that made information about floor debates very accessible. So, for example, uh, GovTrack now automatically tweets what bills are coming to the floor in the next week because of that XML stream that that is available on docs.house.gov. The Senate does a better job on on publishing meet information about committee meetings, and so that's 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 why they both get a B. Um, I, I'd like to see some, you know, House versus Senate competition for who can do who can do better, who can match the other, and, and improve. I'll say one more thing about bills. 
Um, what was interesting to me was that, that in the grading this time, which goes back after about a year, uh, we've, we're, we've returned to the grading with the, the grades you see here. Um, the grade for bills has dropped. I think it was an A minus, and it's gone to a B minus. And probably the reason for that is because our expectations have risen. Um, uh, bills are very important. They're published kind of well. There's an, there's an XML publication for bills, um, but there's a lot more semantic information that could be could be published in bills to make it automatically discoverable what U.S. code sections are affected through all legislation, uh, what uh, locations are affected by legislation, what agencies, bureaus, etc. Um, I think the so so the grades are there. I, I won't go through them all. Maybe we'll get to get back to them on some Q and A. But it is important to emphasize that these grades are a lagging indicator. So the new existence of beta.congress.gov and the, and the projects that you talked about means that there will be more data and the, the, the transparency community has to learn how to use it before it will show up in the grades. So um, given, it, given time constraints, I won't go into the administrat administration's uh, data publication except to say that there is still no machine-readable federal government organization chart, which is fascinating and scary. The simple structure of the government isn't available in ways that computers can use. Well, thank you very much, Jim, and we will get back to both those grades and some of the recommendations that you have. Uh, but instead, uh, uh, just for a moment, I'd like to move to Sunlight stand-up philosopher John Wunderlich. Uh, make sure you have the, the green light on. There you go. Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> Don't know how to follow that introduction, but I'll, I'll try. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's great to be with you for a little bit this afternoon and, and talk through some of these issues the the idea the questions around the way Congress functions and and specifically the House's transparency has has been with some the Sunlight Foundation since our initial founding and we've been deeply involved and so it's one of my favorite transparency topics I think it's one of the the things that we're more familiar with that it, we're going through and, and figuring out what kind of rules changes we want to see in, in the next Congress and, and right now in the House. And we're about to be approaching the Senate, which is uh, disastrously complicated and more difficult to change. So it's nice to focus a bit on the House because it feels a little bit more uh, certainly receptive. And I think that's a question I'll come back to. Uh, but when, when I look at congressional transparency, I, I feel like there are a lot of different ways to approach that question. It's a really broad topic, and there, there are different ways to look at it. So I'm just going to propose three broad headings that, under which I think at least our work can fit. Uh, the first one is ac access to the official work of Congress. And that word official is the, the key word under this heading. And so we've seen a lot of progress and different kinds of, of developments o o during this Congress and in, indeed in the last five or so years on this topic. Uh, so bulk data, while we don't have downloadable access to all the official work of Congress, as Hugh and Jim were both saying, there has been a lot of si significant progress on that front. Uh, toward the ultimate goal, we have the probably most notably the commitment of the leadership and Speaker Boehner and Leader Cantor to release specifically bulk data for all the legislative information. So that's fantastic, and it might take a while for it to happen, but to have leadership committing to it is really important. Um, and then on a related note, I would say docs.house.gov has really been underappreciated in how much it offers. I mean, if you go to docs.house.gov and look at the active bills on the floor, it says for each bill, First of all, it gives you a, you know different formats so that you can download it or so you can get the XML in case you're a developer and want to want to build a website that gives people access to it. On top of that, though, docs.house.gov shows you the time of day to the minute that the bill was posted, and that's really extraordinary that it says you know sometimes it's 1:23 a.m. because the rules committee has insane schedules because because of how they function, but still they they give you to the minute the time the bill was posted. And I think that's just a demonstration of good faith, that they're saying we are here for you to judge us and for you to know exactly how long the bill is online. Uh, and that, in part, was a response to political pressure uh, and, and trying to come up with a better way for things to work, like you said, to recognize that electronic documents are, are the, can function as the official version in the House rules. Now, it wasn't everything that we wanted. For a long time, the rallying cry was 72 hours for all bills. And in effect, the current rule is three legislative days, which can end up in practice being a lot less than 72 hours. But we'll take what we can get. And this is a, actually a really significant difference to say in the rules, the final version of the bill has to be online for three days. That's a, a huge improvement. And docs.house.gov is largely the way that works, bringing in all kinds of other information like amendments and, and uh lots of other, the meeting that led to it, the special rule under which it'll come to the floor, all this information is presented in a really human-friendly way. So I think that's, that's worth 
worth praise. Now, there have been some issues with that. Sometimes the rule has been waived or broken. The, the, the NPR defunding bill comes to mind as one that was, that was considered very quickly. But compared to past Congresses, it's just an, an enormous improvement. So that's one topic is access to the official work of Congress. Um, next, I won't spend a lot of time on it because it's more difficult, but questions of ethics and influence. Basically, what are the unofficial things that are dictating a lot of what's going on? It's frankly a bit of a mess at the moment because of the state of campaign finance. And regardless of your feelings about how campaign finance should be regulated, the current state of affairs is that the law is completely unclear and no one knows if the current court decisions will stand or get knocked down. And it's just, it's insane. It's the Wild West. And that's that really bodes poorly for us to be able to understand what power is actually at work. So it's worth mentioning, I mean, on, the, on a similar topic, the Stock Act recently passed, which is going to have some nice new information for us to sink our teeth into, especially about around financial disclosures. Um, I think there's a lot more that should have been included in that. Uh, the Stock Act has a requirement, for example, that uh, sales of stocks over something like $10,000, financial transactions have to be disclosed monthly. But real estate doesn't have to be disclosed. So somehow $10,000 stock sale is potentially corrupting, but selling a $7 million house just can continue to be private and disclosed once a year. So there's certainly things in there we'd worry about, but that's, that's a whole other set of information. Um, and then the third thing that I want to mention as a category for how to look at Congress's transparency work is how political power functions. So the structure of the political dialogue. And right now, for the last two years, that's been a mess, frankly. And I think that's a byproduct of having divided government. This is not the Rules Committee's fault. Uh, in part, it's Obama's fault. But I think it's, in ways, a, a byproduct of what it means to have divided government. So that's something that we have to continue to think about as we think about how to structure how the House works and what kind of tools we should build on the outside. So real quickly, because I'm going to get the time notifications here. Uh, when, I, when I look at those different categories of congressional information, that two of the things that we work really hard on, on working with, one is taking advantage of the polit political pressures that exist. And we can't create those. Nonprofits would love to be able to generate political pressure, but especially for things like this, it's impossible. So, you know, we take what we can get. And for House reform, with the majority having changed hands twice in the last six years or so, that means that a lot has changed recently because of the need to fulfill promises. So that puts us in the, you know, the House in a more responsive posture, I think, which is good. And then the other thing that I want to mention is broad norms around how things should function. And so two things I point out. One is work like this in the Transparency Caucus and, and the House being generally receptive to the idea that uh, outside groups and the public and, and these sorts of questions should be relevant to how they function. It's not about raw political power. It's about the public interest and thinking about, about how uh, public dialogue should function. And then one other thing on norms is that Sunlight has been working closely with the National Democratic Institute and the Latin American Network for Transparency, uh, for legislative transparency, on a declaration about how legislatures should be open. So if you go to openingparliament.org, there's a very long, well, it, there's a declaration with 40 or so points and 60 pages of notes where you can compare uh, how different parliaments around the world face all these questions. And by and large, they're the same questions. There are bills online or not. Can we see statements of assets? Can we download data? And so so we're not alone in, in dealing with these sets of questions. So going through that whole experience really makes me very glad that we're able to have an institution in the U.S. that is as receptive as it is, where we can come together and think through these problems, even if we don't always agree. Great. So uh, thank, thank you to our three panelists uh, for all of that, I, I think I'd like to start, you know, I, I was going to delve into the details, but I think it might be useful to take a step back and ask the question, why should anybody in this audience or, or out in the general public care about these things? What, you know, we're talking about bulk access, we're talking about docs.house.gov, we're talking about XML. Why should anyone care? Why, how is this relevant uh, to their lives? What is, how, how is this relevant to the functioning of Congress? Um, you know, there's a lot sort of underpinning this, and I think it might be useful to flush that out uh, just a little bit. Jim, do you want to take a first shot? I'd be I'd be happy to. I've I've uh, the 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 fancy way I talk about this problem is to talk about um, rational ignorance and rational inaction. So, as an economic matter, uh, if you're not going to be able to affect something, you're rational to ignore it, even if it does affect you. If your taxes are you know, 30, 50 percent of, of all all the nation's income goes away in taxes, but you can affect it. Most people are, are rational not to do anything about it. So in a way, it doesn't matter to people 
uh, because they can't affect things. But I take as our broad, our, our broad effort to overcome that. So it does become rational to pay attention to what happens in Congress. A more casual way of talking about this, though, is to, is to compare the quality of information that you get in different sections of the newspaper. If you go to the, the weather page, you get charts and data and graphs that people turn to every day and, and it tells them something immediate about their lives. If you go to the financial pages, you get data and charts and graphs that tells them about their investments in ways that, that are, are immediately accessible. Go to the sports page and you get brilliantly intricate data about sports I care nothing about, but evidently somebody does. Uh, and it's fascinating. You see the quality of data that's available in, the, in an ordinary newspaper. And then you turn to the national section of the newspaper and you get Republicans are gunning for a fight and Senator so-and-so is a real go-getter. That's not information people can use in the way they can the, the good data that comes in other sections of the paper. And so if we can move the quality of data that comes out about public affairs and about Congress's behavior to something like the weather page, the sports page, or the financial page, we'll have done something really special. And then it'll be automatic that people care because they have the information that they can act on. You know, the broader question of why people should care um, is, I think it goes back to, to our foundations as a, as a uh, representative democracy. And, you know, back in Ben Franklin's day, the, the tool of choice was the, was the printing press. And today those tools are Google and YouTube and blogs and, and all of these other things. And, you know, we, we talk about transparency and we talk about uh, um, making information available. And I, I've been doing this for uh, more than two decades at this point. And I can tell you I've worked for almost a dozen different members in various capacities. And every member's instant reaction to should we make a particular piece of information available is to say no. I mean, why, why would we put that out there? Because it could create a communications problem. If we're, not, if we're not directly controlling how that information is used, I, we need to put the brakes on that. And, you know, I, I think sort of the, the sea change that's occurred over the last couple of years, and frankly, um, when, when the majority changed this time around, sort of the concerted decision was... All of this information exists someplace. And in the era of Google and YouTube and blogs and everything else, the notion that you can control this, that you can, you can just sit on it, um, is, is not realistic. So better we should be putting that information out there so that individual citizens can, can make their own decisions, that we can... Um, uh, that we can debate these issues on the merits as opposed to who has the better data set. Um, and, and I think you're at, the, you're at the front end of that philosophical change. I mean, and you go from sort of that underpinning to the, to the, uh, to the more concrete examples, things that we're not perhaps getting the best grade on that, that we'd like, you need to keep in mind that there's, you know, 230 years of history here where we have been doing things in a particular way. And to expect that we can instantly flip a switch and suddenly change all of this so that it is in the perfect format at the perfect time, uh, I they're, they're very lofty goals, but they're very hard for us to... Uh, us to hit, and I think with that, I'll I'll yield back, and we can continue the discussion. So I, I do want to follow up on that, and I assume that John has something that he wants to say as well, just because I can I can hear the gears turning from where I'm sitting. Um, but you know, but let me let me come back to you on that. So you know, in, in terms of the tr usefulness for transparency from the public's perspective, I think you laid it out very well. Uh, there's a case that's often made on behalf of transparency from an internal congressional perspective as well. 
uh, it's not just satisfying constituents, but it often um, you know, it has to do with sharing information and uh, resources so that a report that comes to one committee is available to all committees or that everyone gets to see the same bill at the same time. And I was hoping you could sort of play that out a little bit as well. Sure. I mean, you know, these are all these are all things that are sort of evolving. And I'll I'll, I'll use the rules committee as as an example, because as a, in groups where I talk about what the Rules Committee does, um, we've, we've got a number of different roles, and we can use a number of different analogies. We are both, one of the analogies I use is we are both the, the traffic cop for the House, sort of directing that kind of routine uh, legislative business, acting as the Speaker's representative to make sure that, you know, it, things flow the way they're supposed to. We're also sort of the SWAT team at the same time. If something bad happens, um, we're the ones that get called to try and fix it. Um, and as a result, our website has largely uh, been one of, the, one of the focal points for folks trying to figure out what's going on on the floor with respect to legislation. Um, and we have several different kinds of customers. We have um, internal customers, individual uh, folks and committees and member offices who are trying to brief their boss up on what are the amendments that are made in order? What are, the, what are we looking at for the next, uh, next day or next week? Um, we have outside folks. Um, we've got... what interest groups and lobbyists and, and folks like that who are trying to advise their clients as to what's coming down the pike and what they need to deal with. Um, and then we have sort of the broader classes of, of sort of constituents who are just trying to follow an, an issue that's of interest to them uh, for whatever reason. And, and frankly, academics, people who are trying to figure out how the institution works. And all of those folks are coming to, coming to us to try and get that data. Um, it also doesn't hurt the, that the way the majority and minority um, uh, have been doing battle at the Rules Committee since you know, I was a member's driver uh, a very, very long time ago, um, you know, it has been through sort of statistics wars. Who's more open? Who's not? Um, and trust me, I have done battle on that front uh, just as my Democrats have. Um, and we can all sort of work with this data in ways that uh, provides the message that, that we're looking for. Um, but, you know, I think the, the philosophical, I hope I'm getting to your question, but the philosophical underpinning both with what we've been doing uh, so far this Congress, what we hope to do with our, uh, with our website here when this launches hopefully in the next couple of weeks, um, is try and make that information more accessible to all of those audiences. Good example um, of a small change, but I think one that will help, is a couple of years ago we started just, uh, it, actually when we were in the minority, providing a complete list of uh, amendments that were submitted to the Rules Committee and some indication, along with the text, and, and some indication of how they were disposed of. Well, we started doing that in a table, and, and it's, it's helpful, but it's not perfect. Um, but one of the things that we're building into this iteration is the ability to manipulate that table, um, to sort columns so you can instantly see what got made in order, what didn't, what got submitted by whom, and, and those kinds of things. Um, and hopefully, in the not too distant future, uh, you know, we'll be able to provide you with a direct download of that of that information, so that other folks can use that as they want to. Again, I think our attitude has been we shouldn't be playing sort of hide the pea, but rather sort of put the information out there and have the debate on on our performance. Great, John. So on the, do you, do you want me to talk about the interior point or the broader point about the importance? Maybe. As you wish. All right, good. Um, so on the, on the broader point about why this is important, I think almost everyone in the U.S. who's politically aware was angry in the last decade about the 72-hour rule for, because they either were angry about the Patriot Act or the health care bill. 
And th- th- that's to me where the two sides completely flipped that in Fahrenheit 9-11, Michael Moore interviews John Conyers and he says, you know, sit down, son, they don't actually read the bills. And, every, you know, everyone on the left was up in arms. And then the right, the rallying cry against the health care bill was about reading the bill and that it was too long and all, and all, the, all these ideas. And uh, so what I hope is that we can be beyond some of that and, and that politics is always going to have some element of, of political uh procedural accusations that go back and forth. But I think that if you look broadly enough over time, there is such a thing as progress on on legislative process issues, that if you go far enough back, there are things that are clearly worse that we've gotten better at. And that over time, the goal is to, to elevate substance and merit. And, and, and there's a lot of tricky questions about representation and political power that are somewhat intractable, but that over time we're making something that works better, that results in having people feel powerless and frustrated a little bit less often. And, and that, to me, is, over, is overall what, what the goal should be. And then even more specifically to now, I think one reason this work is really exciting at the moment is that technology has totally changed our expectations, as you said, about blogs and Twitter and everything else. That conversation is going to happen no matter what. People are going to talk about everything constantly. And that can be based on the substance of what's happening in Congress. Or if it isn't, something else is going to take its place. And we're not going to like what that's going to be. It's going to be fantasy and ridiculous, out of control, partisan, whatever. There's a lot of things that will rush in to take the place of it. So to me, it's a question of the starting point should be a dialogue is going to be happening constantly and we want that to be informed with at least what's actually happening that that's the very minimum and the best that we should aim for if i can just uh, point out one little thing and trust me my own members are just as guilty of this there is no such thing and never was a 72-hour rule the the rule has been since it was put in place and probably the early 1970s, the third day. Um, So it says that if a a committee report, and that's what it actually refers to, has been available, uh, it can be called up on the third day after which it's been available. And that that has always keyed off of when the government printing office physically delivered offset printed copies to the House. Um, Yeah, things have changed markedly since then um now we're relying on electronic and frankly one of the reasons we recognize electronic documents is that pdf that you're seeing online is the exact same document that we would create that print from we would hit print and some large machine would spew out paper um so they're they're the identical document and I understand that there will never be sort of that perfect amount of time to review something, whether it's short or long or anything like that. But um, my members did it both in the uh, uh, in the period uh, leading up to uh, to the hundred and twelfth Congress. Uh, I know there are lots of folks on the outside who keep talking about the seventy two hour rule. Just felt compelled to point out that it's always been the third legislative day. Uh, as opposed to a true 72 hours, which except in our... In, except in terms of the political promises that get made. That's I, where the I, I, there, In terms of what's in writing versus what were in speeches, I, would, I, I will grant you that. Um, but the, uh, I, I think if you look and see what we've been doing, um, we've actually done that, if not even a little bit better. Um, a good example is for uh, for bills where we're asking for member offices to submit amendments so the rules com- committee can uh, sort of cull through that, do some triage, and then come up with a rule. Uh, you know, during the last two Congresses, we, we actually computed it, and the time between when the rules committee would make an amendment announcement and when we would actually have our meeting was sometimes as short as two days. The average was about two and a half. And we worked really, really hard to try and extend that amount of time so that we're giving folks really uh, a full week uh, 
where we can or four or five day working days where they they have the opportunity to look at that so it's it's one of those things where the rule may say one thing i think our practice has been where we can to try and err on the side of of given more time rather than less. The, the seating for today's panel was had Hugh over here and John over here because of the electric <laughs> debate about three-day versus 72-hour. <laughs> this is why I sit in the middle. <laughs> so I, I, walk, I want to pick up on points that, that both of you have made, uh, and I'm going to uh, have a little bit of fun with it. So, you know, I'm, I'm hearing a lot about the successes in certain respects, and I'm hearing a lot about the deficits, but I think it might be useful to sort of reverse the roles a little bit. So if where do, where do you see um, the, the greatest deficits in terms of what, what Congress needs to do to be more open and transparent? You know, what's the, what's the next big thing, or the next two big things that they need to do? And at, only out of fairness so that they can be ready, I'm going to ask <laughs> similarly, um, I mean, you can identify deficits if you if you so desire, but it would be helpful to identify where in the last two or four years have you seen uh, the greatest uh, positive change as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, sure. Um, you know, I'm actually going to key off of some of the stuff that, uh, that uh, some of the work Jim's done over the years. Um, you know, what, we, what we're doing well right now is we're providing sort of common... Uh, documents in fairly common, easy to produce formats. And, we, and we're doing that better than average, better than we have in, in, in years past. What we're not doing very well is sort of providing some of this metadata that would be useful to folks like Jim or, or you all or uh, folks on the outside. Um, you know, and I think uh, this has a lot to do with sort of the evolution of the tools that we're using. What I constantly have to remind folks of is that we are just slightly more than three decades away from where we produced everything with hot lead type. Okay? Those machines are still sitting over at the government printing office. Um, there's, there's even a movie called Linotype that... Uh, uh, if you're having trouble sleeping, it might be something you want to look at. Um, but keep in mind on the on the time span that that's that's where we were in the early 1980s. Now, uh, as of 2012, we are only probably four or five years into using a Windows-based authoring tool. Okay. So prior to that, we were using text editors and DOS-based stuff. Um, and there are still remnants of those items that are still in our workflow today. Those are things which make it very difficult for us to add a lot of the useful data that, that Jim has been asking for for a long time. Um, and when you pair that with sort of our own internal work habits, um, keep in mind the House House of Representatives. I've been a House guy my entire career, so the House is really the easiest way to think of it is about 460 individual small businesses. You've got 435 member offices, all of whom you know do things in their own ways. You've got about 20 or so different committees. Think of those as kind of medium to large law firms. Again, all of us, while we're all producing the same kind of document, if you were out uh, in a private sector law firm, you, know, you still have to submit the same pleading to, uh, to a judge, but we produce them in different ways. Some people use Word, some people use uh, more, uh, more robust tools to do that. Um, we rely on other legislative branch agencies to provide inputs into all of that. You know, and the problem is, is that there isn't sort of that cohesive architecture. And, and the structure of the House makes it hard to require that of the folks actually producing the data. We're trying. Um, you know, I think it's folks who are sort of leading by example. And as we start to bring online some other tools like phase two of docs.house.gov, um, 
I think you're going to see efforts to try and bring uh, committees along to try and provide that kind of meeting data or other kinds of data that would be helpful. Um, but it's sort of right here where we are right now, that's probably one of the things that we don't do particularly well. The other thing, and this is just a by nature of the institution, is that when when things reach sort of a critical stage, um, which over the last couple of years has happened more often than I think we'd like, um, we aren't great at doing things in sufficient time that we can sort of go through the regular process. And whether that is we're running out of uh, our, our ability to issue debt or we're coming up on a fiscal cliff, places where, you know, I think the public and, and other folks will rightly say this is where this is where transparency is most important. It is by by dint of the way the process is structured and the length of time required for negotiating out very, very difficult issues. Um, it is hard for us to live up to that. We try. Um, but, you know, I it, it the role of the rules committee is to is is twofold. One is to move the majority's agenda and two is to do it in the fa fairest way possible but our responsibilities are in that order and you know i think we will make every effort to try and make stuff available as far in advance as we possibly can but at the end of the day if we're facing something that's critical whether it's of our own creation or not uh, it's it's our responsibility to make sure that that gets done. Thank you very much for that, and, and I, I hope that uh, maybe rising from the from the Q and A that we'll have with the audience in in a couple minutes, uh, you know, there were proposals in in the '90s, for example, to uh, address some of the technological coordination issues. Some of which came to fruition. There's there's the creation of a couple of committees that exist. At one point, there was the idea of creating sort of a chief technology officer for the House who would have responsibilities for coordinating sort of uh, tech-wide policy throughout the, institu throughout the institution. Uh, that never really happened, uh, at least, you know, for whatever reason that that proposal didn't make it forward, although we do see that in peer institutions, the House of Commons and, and the, uh, the House of Lords in the UK, for example, have a, uh, basically a person who's responsible for it throughout both of those, those chambers there. Uh, I think the term chamber is right for that body. I always get confused for the UK. Uh, but basically, where they bring the leadership from, the, from their majority, majority, minority equivalents and, and talk these things out. So it might be interesting uh, to sort of explore how the processes have changed, but we can, you know, that's my question, and uh, we'll be getting to yours shortly. Um, so, Jim, where has the House made progress? I like, I like that question. I'm going to answer a different one first, though. Sure. Um, which is what, what things are what things are so hard that it's unfair to expect the house to have really shown, and and there are plenty. So I, you know, I acknowledge you referred to them, some of these things. You know, you're 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 coming from a baseline of operation that, that is 200 plus years old, and a lot of the practice has grown. It's vernacular practice coming from the um, the original Congress. When I worked on the Hill, I think um, some of the some of the staff of uh, the Legislative Council's office had worked here since the original <laughs> Congress. I'm not sure, so I imagine there's even some, so just just personal retraining to get people generating bills or amendments in XML. Lots of different, lots of practices have to change. But when you look at the grading sheet, uh, right away the three at the bottom that are Fs, those are really hard, or they're things nobody ever really thought about before. So when we went to do our investigation of all the stuff you'd want to know to have good data about what Congress is doing, you go and see that, that there's a constitutional requirement that each house maintain a journal. The journal is sort of, if you, if you want to talk about it hierarchically, the journal is just the sort of basic bare bones what happened. We got a message from the Senate. We sent a message to the Senate. We, we sent a bill to the president. We you know, received and so on and so forth. Now that's, that journal has exploded because of the Congressional Review Act. But, but there's a thing that if you wanted to see what, how, the, how the Congress was working, you'd want the journal to be represented in data. Nobody's working on that. It's not a huge deficit that they're not, but if you want the whole picture, uh, you should probably have it. Amendments, there are, there are amendments, some places visible, but amendments that actually 
that actually reveal how they affect the underlying legislation is a super complicated problem, uh, particularly if you get second tier amendments. How do you represent, I propose to change the document that proposes to change this document? And usually the document itself is a proposal to change existing law. Um, so, I, I, you know, there, there, there have been proposals floated around to, to change the way bills are introduced in Congress so that rather than just being amendments to existing code, it says the code shall say, and the changes are embedded in it. Some state legislators do it that way. It'd be a lot simpler for everybody. But that's why amendments is, is gets a low grade. It's really, really a hard thing to do. Um, so there are lots of things that are that get bad grades because they're hard, and our grading system doesn't have a, it's really, really hard, so you get a good grade anyway. No social promotion uh, out of the Cato Institute. Um, but there are plenty of good things. And I talked about the bio guide. Again, some genius a few years ago created the bio guide, and its benefits are are quite uh, are, are quite ready, uh, quite apparent. Even though we do have to gather that data intermediated by websites, the existence of committee identifiers. Similarly, its basic sort of structural identity information for committees is good. Too bad it's on a PDF document in the House. Um, bills in XML. That's a even though the 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 semantic information that I talked about isn't isn't there for the most part. To have bills in XML in the first place is a good starting point. Uh, I've got a project where um, cross your fingers, jinx yourself by saying this in front in front of a public audience. We're going to go into production in the next Congress, adding that semantic information to the house to the House XML, um, just, and put it out there and see if see if people use it. Uh, vote information is quite good. It's done in XML, quite accessible. Uh, the 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 knock. I'm sorry for you know adding down the the bad things in with the good, um, is that unanimous consent and, and voice votes aren't there, and that's as many decisions are made through unanimous consent and voice vote as are through roll call votes, and it's so for many purposes just as important to get the UCs and the and the voice votes. Um, so, but the, the, that that's uh, that's important stuff. It, it it's interesting to me actually that some of the most important work is is kind of simple. That is BioGuide. Um, so just unique identifiers for every member. So that, that simple fact can be integrated into lots of different documents. Identifiers for committees and subcommittees. Identifiers for meetings, just identifying basic information about meetings, what, what, what organization in the House or Senate it is, when it's happening, subject matter. You've done a lot. So there are good things happening. It's, it is very hard stuff, and I, I don't think anybody should be you know, uh, taken to the woodshed because the grades aren't high quite yet. We're, it's, it's, we're all learning. Great. And uh, as we're about to go to John uh, to answer this question as well, I also want folks to be thinking, but of course, pay attention to John when he gives his answer about questions that you'd like to ask. I know it's hard to do two things simultaneously, but we're all going to try. So, John? Thanks. So, uh, as, as far as good things, I, I, I agree with what, what both speakers before me said. I, I, I think especially, Hugh, I, I agree that there are a lot of specific things online now that weren't before, and I specifically called out and do it again, docs.house.gov and rules.house.gov, both I use a lot at work, and it usually answers the question that I have for even to say, like, what are all the amendments that were proposed for this bill that got voted up or down? It, it's just, it, it's pretty extraordinary, I think, especially when you compare it to other committees in the House that tend to do terribly at some of those things, especially. I mean, it's because the Rules Committee has a different function, but I think you guys have done a fantastic job. Um, another thing I would call out specifically for the House is that at the beginning of the 112th Congress, Speaker Boehner committed to getting video online, streaming video of committees, and the House has done way better than I thought it would have at that, because it's, it's really up to the committee chairs to do it, and overall, they're all streaming as long as you ignore every appropriations committee, right? <laughs> so it's, it's kind of terrible oversight. So if we ignore every appropriations committee, it's almost 100%. It's really fantastic. We went through the trouble of auditing this and looking at every hearing. Was it streaming or not? We had this huge spreadsheet. And it, like the results are really clear. They're all online, except for the appro appropriations committees that put nothing online. So like the problem there is really clear. It, you know, It's really like between leadership and the appropriations committee chairs to figure out. But if you ignore that, really really good so so that that's that's i think significant um and then as far as the the broader failure i mean i mean and it's really the same thing hugh said it's not necessarily the house's fault although you could talk about boehner in some sense but it's the super committee to me is emblematic of the biggest failure which was just 
how about we do away the, the assumption behind the super committee was if we dispense with all democratic process and accountability and meet in secret maybe then we'll have bipartisanship and progress maybe that's how we should deal with all of the most difficult problems rolled up together uh and I, i'm that that's how we summarized it at the time we worked on the super committee transparency act with a number of allies to, tr to try to beat the thing back it was really a deeply frustrating thing hopefully that never comes up again as a good idea because i just think it was terrible on top of that though i think the super committee made it clear that some of the terms defined in the house and senate rules are not defined well enough so the super committee was able to say that their meetings were public because when they were meeting for 10 hours a day in the in the CVC in the visitor center, it wasn't a meeting because they weren't voting when it was obviously a meeting. And so, like every journalist, just basically said this this is crazy. So, one of the things that we're thinking through in in the next House's rules, and who knows if this is feasible? It's probably up to Hugh <laughs> largely, but is is the question of what should count as a meeting, and and that's not an easy thing to define. But I think one of the lessons for the super committee for us was to say it's clearly not defined well enough if what the super committee was doing was able to pass as not being a meeting. Uh, just to just to come back on on that point a little bit, and I'm the first to tell you that uh, the the super committee, so called super committee, uh, well, I I feel compelled to point out it wasn't a house idea in the first place, but um, and I know because I was there because I had to draft it. Um, so sort of starting from the point that hey, this wasn't our idea in the first place. Um, you know, I you you bring up a good question as to what is and is not a meeting. I think uh, this may be an area where some of the most ardent uh, transparency advocates and and I would probably part part company, which is the notion that every single discussion of members or groups of members needs to be sort of out in the open and. Having having actually done substance at one point in my career, I can tell you there's that stage in every negotiation where each side is going to put out really, really, really bad ideas. And you know you have to do it because you've got, whether your, your member has uh, an interest group or constituent interest or you're carrying water for the administration, I've worked both sides of that. You you've got to you've got to carry water for something that you know um, is not a great idea, and to some extent, having a situation where you can trade offers, where you can where you can discuss issues outside of uh, a camera, is is important because the five minute rule and and sort of the formalities that we have for for committee process don't always lend themselves to to sort of having those kind of honest discussions and the honest back and forth that that members need to have um you know that said um there's there's room for abuse on on sort of both sides um you can you can game the definition of a hearing or a meeting very, very easily. Um, you know, in my prior careers as committee counsel, we've we've walked that line when we've had to. Um, but by the same token, there just needs to be some ability for members, and and it may be sort of a committee of the whole. It may be a situation where it's all ten members of that committee sitting down and 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 talking, and you know, it, it's uh, it ain't perfect, but it, it's better than a lot of the alternatives. Jim, that's a that I wanted to say something riffing on what John said, but you've added added more to yeah. to what I wanted to get to. We'll go the this the minutia of when is a meeting a meeting uh, actually illustrates a very sort of high high level point about transparency. The demand for transparency, the read the bill demand, in a, in a in a dimension of it is a demand to stop being politicians because what politics is is that deal making that that is required in some of the circumstances the congress finds itself in these days so 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 we'll make we'll have these things where everybody's in the same room but it's not technically a meeting um 
Hugh confessed that sometimes the bills move too fast. And the 72-hour slash three-day rule, whichever you prefer, is meant to kind of stop that happening because that's politicians being politicians. And the um, President Obama's done like before signing was a parallel parallel promise that I've been tracking since the beginning. He's just at just at sixty-six uh, percent compliance with the pledge to put bills online for five days, having received them from Congress before he signs them. And it's uh, roughly speaking, the um, bills to rename post offices get five days of of sunlight, and the bills to spend huge sums of money or to or to change around the organization of our health care system. Uh, no, I, don't, I, I'm not sure if that one did or not, but in, in generally speaking, the the more important legislation moves fast and doesn't get sunlight before signing uh, because a deal's been struck and it's a very sensitive deal, and if we have to wait two, two three days, the deal could be broken up by all the interests who care about it. That's, that's, that's Congress saying, we've got these decisions. You don't have them, public. Um, one of the reasons I like transparency is ideological is that it re represents a shift in power back from Congress out to the people whom Congress affects. Uh, in terms of s successes that I've seen, has been a cultural shift in the House. Uh, people in both parties, uh, in different places within the institution, are having the conversations that they really did not have before. I'm not seeing this on the Senate side. Um, you can tell by my panelists from you know, the Senate Rules Committee who's sitting to Hughes Wright uh, about how difficult it is to, um, uh, to have this kind of conversation in the other chamber. But at least with the House, um, there seems to be a number of members who are serious about these issues and that their staff are able to get together and have these kinds of conversations. I mean, uh, you know, the creation of the Congressional Transparency Caucus, the fact that we can have Hugh here at this conversation in a public place. Uh, is a chain is a sign of a cultural shift that um, is really f fascinating to watch as well as 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 helpful as it happens to be. Um, but this kind of cultural change, even in the House, is not spread evenly. Uh, John was talking about the Appropriations Committee before, uh, and he, and he's right to mention them. That's where there is one of the greatest confluences of money and power, and you can't see subcommittee markups. 50% of their hearings during the time that we looked at are not available online. Uh, the issues uh, with what they do in particular, you know, goes on and on and on. And that's really where you see some of the most important decisions being made within the House and at a House where there is, you know, an incredibly strong uh, commitment to major aspects of transparency. So it, it's really kind of interesting. But in, in, I, I do want to add one more point and then, sorry, uh, we'll go on, to, which is, major failing that I was surprised that that wasn't mentioned was the ability to find out what's going on in the committee sufficiently in advance to be able to get the the committee schedules the Senate has a rule where everyone all the committees are required to file notices of the hearings with the Senate in advance and they're published in the record uh, you can look at three weeks out four weeks out oftentimes even longer than that it's not ideal they don't do it in XML but at least it's viable uh, the house doesn't do that in the same kind of way it's very difficult to find out what's going on. You have to pay f for um, uh, you know, congressional quarterly or, or these other subscriptions to try to, to figure out what's happening. Um, so there are still sort of interesting disparities between the two bodies. Uh, you know, the House is, in many respects, way more advanced than the Senate, but there are, of course, uh, certain circumstances where the, the tables are, are reversed. So now that I'll get off my... Can I say one thing? I think one okay. one thing about the Senate that should be should be mentioned is Senator Mark Warner's reintroduction of the Data Act, uh, which is m much more about uh, executive branch transparency. But uh, but but when you mention that you know, to imply that there's nothing happening in the Senate is a mistake. The Data Act, which has already passed the House, is over in the Senate, and Warner just uh, just reintroduced it. So um, that's a a bright light among a lot of darkness over there. So for questions, and we'll start in in the front row here, and. Uh, we're bringing a microphone right around. Please. Hello. Yeah, um, I'm uh, Rafael De Janeiro. I helped Congressman Brian Baird write the Read the Bill resolution in January of 2006. And I want to say that a lot of progress has been made. And I would praise especially the staff of the House Rules Committee and the um, Sunlight Foundation with the technical expertise in creating, you know, 
docs.house.gov and a lot of other things. I'd like to resist, however, what I think might be a misimpression some people would come away with, that this is primarily a technical problem. Um, I think it is ultimately a political problem, especially the question of availability of really important bills. You know, the Patriot Bill can pass, and that could have a provision that is going to lock some of us up. This stuff really matters. And the, um, you know, when Ronald Reagan um, waved the um, big bills around in his State of the Union in the late 80s, you know, the Democrats couldn't have pleaded that, oh, you know, they didn't have Microsoft Word, so, you know, they, they didn't have enough time or whatever. And I would say the, con the, the continuing resolution, I believe, last December was uh, very fast, a very big, very fast bill. Um, and there's others. And, you know, it seems like when it really, really matters, that's when we're least likely to get the time to read these that, that we really need to defend ourselves as a society and so on. And so I want to say why all these technical advances are good and grading, you know, 30, 40 different variables is good. The real crucial thing to me is, you know, before we pass these huge laws, especially if it's in the middle of the night or whatever, you know, what is the political failure here that we still can't do this? And I would, I would also note that it is doable. The Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, there was 72 hours on the conference report. And in fact, everybody in Washington, I was marveling because it was a, um, it was sort of accepted. Nobody argued with it. And I met a lobbyist uh, a couple months ago who was complaining to me that they couldn't stick their tax thing in there at the last minute because you know, it was going to hang out there for 72 hours and they, they couldn't get away with it. So this can be done even on huge things like the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, I would, you know, I would ask uh, Hugh, you know, what can the Rules Committee do, and in particular the members, to actually enforce this? And you know, change the expectations of the leadership, the committees, and everyone else, and say, look, we're the traffic cop, and the answer is you're not going to go if you don't do three days. And, it, and by the way, it should be 72 hours, because right now sometimes it's 24 and a half hours, um, you know, if, when we're sort of complying. With, with respect to sort of the operation three-day rule, I, I understand that some folks think that 72 hours is, is best. Um, yeah, the problem comes in when you're not not necessarily as much in the example where you're using, um, but where we're three hours shy. Okay, and then you know, I think the question is: Okay, are we going to keep members, fifteen hundred cops, all of the clerks, folks? and everybody else literally twiddling their thumbs for three hours before we can call something up. Three hours short of 72. And, the, and the reason, that's one of the reasons we don't count hours. First of all, counting days is a lot easier. Um, in large part because, you know, again, going back to the origins of these items, we didn't get a time when the, GP, the green GPO delivery truck arrived at the loading dock and the time that it took somebody to get from the loading dock in the back of this building all the way over to the house floor. It, it, we said, okay, it arrived on Monday. You're good to go on Wednesday. Um, you know, I think the other, the other issue is do we, what happens in that instance where, you know, we put something up on a Friday or we've got an intervening holiday or something like that. Um, how do you, how do you account for that? So that, that's one issue and why it becomes very, very hard for us to count hours, um, from a, from a logistical standpoint on the floor. Um, yeah, the, the second issue is, is a political one and the, you know, when the clock stops being the leverage point, I think you'll see it. Uh, it's a lot easier for us to, to put that three days in there with uh, absolutely no exceptions. Um, but unfortunately, the clock in a lot of these instances is the leverage point. So even if we're three, four, five days out, um, and the decisions get made. Okay, this is what goes in, this is what doesn't, this is the deal. 
the execution time to go from that to something that we can post online hopefully can can happen within that that period but not not always and you know i think the the balancing act that goes on there is what's the consequence for waiving this and you know if that means the us is going to default on its debt i i feel reasonably certain that that the membership will make the decision to to waive this if and keep in mind that the only way that this gets waived is if 218 members vote for a rule from the rules committee that's the only way that happens so we are a majoritarian institution and as long as you can get a majority to do something um then you can do it the i i think i think we have been trying to enforce uh, new norms, trying to enforce greater availability of things. And, and you're absolutely right. And like I said earlier, where we have situations where we, we are running against the clock and there are potentially dire consequences for uh, not meeting that clock, that's going to make it a little bit harder for us to, for us to meet that. That doesn't mean we're not going to try, but it, it makes it harder for us to do that. We ought to recognize this is political failure, and we're still passing massive bills, spending trillions of dollars, or laws about people can be locked up in the middle of the night for no reason, no habeas corpus, whatever, and, and people aren't, they're not getting due consideration. And we ought to say that's an important political failure in the Congress. And while it's wonderful to have XML and all these other things, you know, no matter what the technology is, this is, this is not good enough, I guess is what I'd say. Let me let me let me put the political failure actually on the public, and that's the thing I think we in the transparency community are trying to remedy. Uh, as more and more people are watching what goes on, um, they'll they'll get to understand the cadence of of legislation and the exceptions. They'll start to notice more and more often, and I suspect what will happen is someday some member will say, "Hugh, I didn't take your advice last time, and that really stung because I heard about it. So I'm going to take your advice this time," and and Congress will naturally incline itself to, to to follow regular order as the public perceives it. So it's it's as much as it's our demand of rules to, to act in a way that's transparent, um, the public, we need to, the transparency community needs to educate the public so the public understands how the process is supposed to work, and it's a big red flag when the process is, isn't going that way, and they say, this has got to stop. So the, the demand has to come from both sides, I think. It, and I agree. I, ultimately, that's the only thing you can rely on. I mean, I, rules are incredible. Rules reform is incredibly important. We put a lot of effort into it, but it's all waivable, as Hugh said. It's, you know, the majority can change it at any time, and and so the thing that keeps the rules from changing constantly is public expectations and norms about what's appropriate and what isn't. And I think that that, that that's why we didn't go crazy about the seventy-two hour thing. Is I mean, I keep putting up a blog post that says has been or promising 72 hours or whatever but I you know try not to be too mean about that because it is a big shift that says we are going to hold ourselves to that and and even if it gets accepted sometimes I mean that the one reliable thing here is norms in a democracy for how things should function and the even the best rule is waivable like I will choose clear expectations over clear rules any day I guess that's my point the concern that I often have is do the members know what they're voting to waive and this is where, you know, there's, there's a rule in the House, uh, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Ramsire, Ramsair? Ramsair rule. Which basically is, it shows how the proposal would actually change the law. And it's waived all the time. There are technological reasons why why the clerk, uh, well, the clerk, it's not the clerk, why the um, ledge council is having difficulty showing that. Um, and, and there are other sort of issues with it as well, and the Senate has its own equivalent rule. Um, the concern that I have, I think, is, is shared by the concern that you have as well, which is, you know, you can, you know, you can get 218 people to vote for anything given, you know, the, the, the right circumstances. And most of the time, of course, you can't get two people to vote for anything. Uh, but one of the things they can vote for is to, is to basically vote for their own ignorance that we don't know what's inside. And that, and that, is, and that is a concern, but that is a, that, it's a politics concern. And it's, it has to do with the, under our, the overarching nature of our, of our, of our polity and let me just come back on two items um uh, two items there one is this concern that we're constantly waving things just so everybody knows 
every rule, Republican, Democrat, probably for the last several decades, contains a general waiver of all points of order. Mm-hmm. Um, we we call that um, we call that a prophylactic waiver, so that it's there to protect the chair from having to deal with and dispose of spurious points of order. One of the things that we started in the past and have really tried to build into our process at the Rules Committee, um, this Congress has been a detailed explanation of any waiver that is actually covered by that. You can pick up the report for any rule, and it will say either all of these waivers are, (coughs) excuse me, purely prophylactic, or we say we're waiving this rule, this rule, and this rule. And here's why. Because we we didn't get X, Y, or Z in time, um, because there, one of the most common is we have to wave cut go all the time to fix a cut go problem. So, you know, in order for us to get the amendment up that fixes the problem, we actually have to waive the rule. Again, that we classify that more in the technical um, category, but where we have waived the three day rule, we've been very upfront about saying, this is what we did, and you know, having folks judge us uh, on that. On Ramsayer, I I can go back and check. I don't think we've had that many waivers of that this Congress, um, but you know, it's it's something that we we definitely prefer to have from from committees. I think the Ledge Council, Law Revision Council, other folks are are involved in the project to produce more of that kind of comparative information and try and make that available to us, you know, committees, members, and other consumers who can, who would benefit from having that. Hi, I'm Angela Canterbury. I'm with the Project on Government Oversight. And I think another good example of one of the better, more open processes that we've had over the um, last Congress or two was the Dodd-Frank conference where we were able to see all of the formal meetings and negotiations um, around the table, and that's a rarity uh, today. I also uh, have to mention that the Senate is so far behind the House in terms of all kinds of disclosure. There are some committees where you can't even get the rules for those committees. Even if you harass the office, not only is it not online, but they just don't make it public, and that's unforgivable in my eyes. Uh, Some of us have worked on a campaign to try to make um, the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, more open in how it reviews um, an authorization bill for the Pentagon spending, for example, where you know, billions are authorized, but there's no transparency in that process. Um, but I also just wanted to give my, my good friend and colleague, John, an opportunity to amend or clarify a statement he made about nonprofits and their ability to pressure. <laughs> my, my point is, is that it's, it's really difficult. Like, we do what we can to be relevant to what is politically attractive, right? And, and so we all play in that world. But compared to the minority switching hands and the, and the pressure that's at play there, that's very difficult for a nonprofit like either of ours to just create. So so we can't create the political circumstances, but we can do things that are um, uh, complementary to what they are. That's what sort of, Does that clarify what you so meant? Difficult, but not impossible. Yes, yes, Thank I'm you. with you. Jim Snyder, my question is to Hugh, and it concerns the transparency of congressionally sponsored events like this. So I've been going to events like this for about 15 years and have been involved in organizing about a half dozen of them. Uh, they're incredibly valuable for nonprofits. Not only are they free, but uh, they're high prestige. Uh, we get great uh, trade press, not doesn't apply to this particular audience, but it does in, in general often and indirectly then through mass media. Oh dear, you insult my audience. The, you know, <laughs> well, just unfortunately, if you're some industry of it, you get trade press, but open government events don't uh, don't get trade press. And uh, you look at you know foundation proposals; they're you know full of references to Hill events because it's just influence and what. And so it's an incredibly valuable perk. And it does change behavior. And the question is, like lobbyist disclosure and whatnot, the taxpayers subsidize 5013Cs to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Should the database, I've been pushing this for a half dozen years, including with sunlight to put it on the agenda, should the the database 
of congressional sponsors of rooms like this and the nonprofits that receive them, should that be public as part of you know the whole ethics.gov routine? This is a, a very valuable perk, and it's almost completely invisible. I've never seen an article on it, and it gives you a lot of insight. I don't, not in any way suggesting that sunlight is defective, but I am saying it's an important resource for 5013Cs, and it should be disclosed. Uh, well, I think this sort of fits in with a theme we've been discussing all along this afternoon, which is that uh, um, sometimes it, it's harder to uh, to focus on issues that are that are not quite as high profile. Um, you know, the other the other issue is is one of resources. Um, you know, I think if folks were sitting down and identifying a whole series of um, uh, issues and problems, um, to be honest, this is the first time I'm sort of hearing of, of the concept, as opposed to having a you know, a 20 minute long, 60 minutes piece on insider trading by members of Congress and their staffs. So given those two items and limited resources of the powers that be to produce, maintain, and otherwise make that data available. One person controls it for all of the Jim? Centralized database, so in that sense, it's, it's but to, but. Uh, Sort of given given those two items, I think you know the the emphasis is going to be on the bigger fire that we need to put out. And you know, as recently as uh, um, last week, you know, we were we were dealing with the continuing Stock Act problems. Um, and you know, I this is this next statement is purely Hugh Halpern, not my members, not my leadership or anybody else, but just to point out that you have a whole class of individuals in the executive branch who do not think their information should be out there. Um, and as I was saying to uh, the other members of the panel, the same information about yours truly has been available online, whether I like it or not, for the past several years. So you can go online and see exactly how lousy my investment strategy is. But, you know, there are a number of people, some of whom may have a perfectly legitimate reason for, for not disclosing this. But, you know, my personal opinion is that there are those who are probably trying to cast a much wider net to capture people who shouldn't uh, to, to try and uh, keep more of that information uh, off, offline than than probably should be. So, um, you know, I think we'll always be willing to take a look at uh, um, other items, but sort of, again, balancing, we, we've got a very small group of people who do this work for the House. And, you know, the House as a whole has taken about a 12% cut in ledge branch budget over the last several years. Um, you know, we've got dwindling resources and we need to leverage those for sort of where we get the biggest bang for the buck. So um, I think that. Yep. And John, you had something to add to that as well? Yeah, just on the on the Stock Act, we've, we've described, you know, as there's all these implementation issues, we, we, we've basically characterized that I think the concerns are 50% va valid about having disclosed the assets of your spouse who's, say, an intelligence agent or something, and 50% scaremongering among senior executive service members that just don't want to disclose things sh that should clearly be disclosed. And I don't, I, I don't claim to be, able to, to be able to sort out exactly which of the claims are valid or not, but you know, there are a lot of people that specialize in this all the time that should be able to work it out, and it's, it's kind of frustrating that all these SES people came out of the woodwork after it passed with suddenly a different a different kind of concern. So I, I would agree with that sentiment too. And I would love to hold an Advisory Committee on Transparency Act event at the White House where we can talk about uh, executive branch transparency. I'm sure we would have a number of issues which would be a lot of fun. So as, as we're beginning to wrap up, I, I'd like to just ask the panelists, you know, we, we've spoken a lot about um, uh, you know, what's happened in the past, you know, successes and some of the, the deficits that we've seen as well. Um, so I'm just going to ask briefly, and we'll start with John and we'll work back this way. Um, 
what would you say should be the next step or two that Congress should take to be more transparent? Uh, so we're we're ready for bulk data. We're ready, you know, as soon as soon as possible. That would be fantastic, so that all these third party sites that are thriving can can have reliable, immediate, reusable information that empowers people to analyze and and reuse congressional information. So that's clearly there. We've work, been working on for a long time. Um, all the public stuff of Congress that's required to be public should be online. And obviously, there's been a ton of strides there. We'd love to see the appropriations committees uh, catch up a little bit. And there's a lot of kinds of documents that would be important and valuable to have online. And then the, I, I guess the third category I would say is is uh, influence and ethics disclosure that is proportional to like the, uh, America's role in the world, that we should be leading what that means. And right now, you know, we did for a long time, and right now I think we've fallen behind because it's politically difficult to deal with. And so the Stock Act, rather than let's create a vision for how disclosure works, it was more like we need to pass something right now. And I'm sure a lot of work went into it, but but ethics shouldn't just be legislated on as a result of scandal in a hurry. And that's kind of what we saw. So I'd like to see you know that be better developed. I think the most important important thing going forward would probably be be passage of the data act or implementation of what the data act has in it without legislation it doesn't matter to me which the reason why is not just because you get more transparency in agencies bureaus programs and projects as the as the data act requires in order to provide transparency in spending in outlays um, but but that would have effects back back to Congress, um, for example, where so consistent identifiers of all the things that Congress is legislating about could be put into bills. So you'd really start to automate your oversight of what's going on in Congress. The, it's the, the structure we really need, I, in my opener, you know, I said there's no machine-readable federal government organization chart. That's, that's kind of shocking. And if passage of the Data Act causes that to come into existence, that's hugely important, and as I said, it, that that would uh, integrate itself back with with the processes in Congress. Congress is doing better, though it's not in in the A range. Congress is doing better than the administration right now, and the, this is an administration that came in three and a half years ago touting transparency, and I, and I think it's worth worth recognizing that that we're talking about um, slow, steady, slow progress. Here in the House, but but the House deserves credit, where I'm not willing to give um, credit to the to the administration. Maybe because the administration overpromised, but uh, but the House seems to have promised fairly accurately what it could do, and is making steps forward uh, toward that. More, more, more. Well, you know, I I I would say we're doing everything great and we we need to build on that um you know one of the things that i know you guys it doesn't necessarily become obvious to you all um uh, because you're the consumers of the end product but probably where where we need to make the greatest number of strides are our internal tools to produce this stuff and there are some great folks who are working on these now um but, you know, I, like I said, I've been working in committees for uh, more than two decades. And uh, we, we've got a lot of very, very bright folks, but a lot of folks without a whole lot of technical knowledge. And, you know, getting, getting folks to use the tab key instead of five spaces sometimes is hard. Um, so you can just imagine saying, hey, you can hyperlink to this or, you know, we need to put this piece of metadata in here. Um, all of those things are, we, we need to dumb down that process uh, a little bit for our, our, ourselves internally so that folks who are really primarily focused on, on policy can also produce documents in a format that can generate the kind of outputs that everybody around this room is probably looking for. Um, and, you know, we're, like I said, we're making great strides on that, on that front, but um, there's always, always more and uh, farther to go. And I think when our tools sort of reach the stage where we can produce the kinds of things that um, 
you all are looking for quickly and easily, I think you'll see sort of the exponential effect of that as as we go forward. I, I think that's right. And I, I think that, um, you know, we also, you know, for those of us who are not uh, in the government, it's, it's incumbent on us to continue to, to encourage collaboration inside and outside. Um, all of us have thoughts and suggestions to offer. Some of us have technological expertise to lend uh, or, or policy expertise sometimes as well. Um, that doesn't have to all be done necessarily internally. Uh, and just as it's terrifying when the government says, you know, we're from the government and we're here to help you. Well, we're from the transparency community. <laughs> we're here to help as well. And with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank Representatives Isa and Quigley for um, uh, helping us to have this event. It's to C-SPAN for covering it. For more information, please visit transparencycaucus.org, including uh, the scheduling for our next event. And thank you all so much. Sorry.